Hello and welcome. I'm Maureen Conway. I'm a vice president at the Aspen Institute and executive director of the Institute's Economic Opportunities Program. At the Economic Opportunities Program, our mission is to advance strategies, policies, and ideas to help working people and small businesses thrive. We are particularly focused on ideas to address the systemic inequities that influence access to economic opportunity. One's race, gender, or home zip code should not determine whether one has access to a good job or the opportunity to start a small business. Thanks to everybody for joining our question and answer session today with Rebecca Dixon of the National Employment Law Project. And thank you, Rebecca, for being with us again. Really appreciate your time. Um, if you have a question, you can tweet a question using the hashtag talk opportunity, or you can email it to us at eop at aspeninstitute.org in addition to using the chat function here on the Zoom webinar that uh, everyone has probably gotten very familiar with recently. Um, we've already received a number of questions from folks before the event, and we're looking forward to getting to those in just a few minutes. Um, I want to note that last week we recorded an online interview with Rebecca um, and we shared that, e that video out via email and social media. Um, and today we're following up on that uh, with this live Q&A conversation. Um, so I hope everybody got a chance to, to take a look at that, at that conversation. We discussed how the unemployment insurance system is designed as a federal state system, the issues facing low-wage workers, workers of color, and women workers in accessing unemployment benefits, and how variations by state can exacerbate some of the inequities by income and race. So if you didn't get a chance to listen, uh, you can find that conversation on our website at as.pn slash opportunity in America. The crisis we're now facing in, a, in our country is really unprecedented in all of our lifetimes. The rapid changes in our economic landscape that have accompanied the coronavirus epidemic are having a devastating impact on both low-wage workers and on small businesses. The sheer numbers of people who are, um, who are uh, suddenly experiencing economic dislocation across the country, um, they're just difficult to take in. Um, the disparities in economic impact on households, both in economic, both uh, the impact on the people's um, finances, but also the, the impact on people's health um, are starting to emerge. Um, we are seeing that low wage workers are, are uh, among the most likely to be losing their jobs now. So workers with limited incomes are suddenly without any income. Uh, and we know that workers in low-wage sectors are disproportionately women and disproportionately people of color. Um, but with respect to health, health impacts, uh, we're starting to see some data. The state of Michigan recently released data on coronavirus cases by race. Uh, and the disproportionate impact on Black residents of Michigan could be seen in that data too. Uh, so these disparities uh, regarding the impact of the crisis are still emerging, but the picture thus far uh, is grim. In the coming weeks, we'll be having more conversations in our virtual opportunity in America forum regarding how the crisis is affecting both workers and small businesses all across the country uh, and what can be done to address the disparate impacts that could further divide our already divided society. As always, we are extremely grateful to the Ford Foundation, Prudential Financial, the Walmart Foundation, the Sheridan Foundation, and MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for their support of our work. Okay, so Rebecca, since the last time we, uh, we had a chance to chat, things have gone from horrific to uh, unimaginable, basically. So before we turn to everybody's questions, I really just wanted to pause and, and give you a chance to sort of comment on the situation we're seeing now um, and how things uh, are going and what you and your colleagues at NELP are seeing. Sure, so the UI program is um, is actually kicking in and doing what it was designed to do, but it's it's a program that most folks are not aware of if they're not accessing it, right? So it's just kind of um, a safety net in the background. And what we're finding is that it's the first, it's what we found historically is it's the first line of defense against poverty and homelessness, because when your income stops from work, you can apply for unemployment benefits and receive them. Um, just unprecedented that 10 million people have filed for unemployment insurance in the last two weeks. 
And we know that that doesn't include everyone who's unemployed. So there's just a massive amount of, of need and economic pain right now. Um, and so I'm excited to join you to be able to answer some questions that might help put some folks' minds at ease and help them access the program. Oh, great, thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, since we last spoke, I also think you've had a chance to kind of get a better sense of um, how the response legislation, and it's good to hear you think it's, it's kind of going well. Uh, you know, Congress uh, passed uh, a couple of bills and, and that influenced sort of um, unemployment insurance. So maybe you could just kind of give us a quick overview of the highlights uh, of that legislation that we should be keeping in mind um, as we sort of move this conversation forward. Absolutely. So um, I'm sure we'll get a question about being able to get through to apply for benefits, either yeah. by phone <laughs> or by computer. And so the first piece of legislation that the federal government passed in the Families First Act was an additional billion dollars to states to um, rapidly staff up and expand their unemployment insurance administration um, because this was sudden, right? And they were basically staffed based on the unemployment rate that we had last year, which was really low. So they were sort of at a bare bones staffing level. And so they're having to ramp up. Uh, so the first, the first bill included money to help them do that. Um, and then the second bill, um, the CARES Act, included um, $250 billion in enhancements for UI. Um, the way those um, play out is the extra $600 per week um, for UI claimants. So the goal there to bring up the replacement to replace the average wage of an average American. So the average American earns about $1,000 a week and the average UI payment is about um, $350 a week. So that's one piece. Um, the second piece is an extension of uh, 13 weeks of benefits. So uh, in addition to whatever the state eligibility is for claimants, um, right now benefits in the states range from 12 weeks to 26 weeks with the large percentage being 26 weeks. So that would be getting most folks to 39 weeks um, if they're still unemployed at that time. And then the last piece, which is really important and groundbreaking, um, is based off of the Disaster Unemployment Program, which you know we've seen all of these disasters, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Katrina, and fires. So in a disaster, we have a special program that um, when there's a disaster declaration, that comes on and covers workers who are not usually covered. So that's your self-employed mm -hmm. workers, your workers who are working for platforms and doing rideshare work or gig work, um, and um, uh, workers who are classified as independent contractors, so not, not as employees. Um, so those workers are actually have accessibility to this program during times of disaster, but and in and, and some states, maybe because of issues of how they're classified, they would also have it at other times, but primarily uh, just during disasters. And so what this program has done is basically acknowledge that this is a disaster for the whole country. And it has put into place a program that will provide unemployment insurance benefits and coverage to those workers, the self-employed workers, the gig workers and independent contractors. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty amazing, and it, kind of speaks to the, the magnitude of, of what we're dealing with right now. So those are the top lines of what's in the legislation. Great, terrific. So we have, an, we have a lot of questions. Um, uh, and I was gonna start with a couple of questions from some of my, uh, my, some of my colleagues. Um, so uh, they, there are some questions about some specific workers. And so I think this will kind of build on um, uh, a little bit of uh, what you were just saying. Um, uh, but my colleagues in the Aspen Institute Forum on Women and Girls were asking about, um, you know, the impact in particular on care and domestic workers. So they write um, that we talked about last time in our, in our video, we talked, discussed long-term policy changes that would benefit workers and their families. Um, but, you know, are there other things to address inequities um, in UI? And in particular, um, how do we think about care and domestic workers? Um, and and what's uh, available for them and their and their families. And I just also want to mention that um, Ashley Putnam at the Economic Growth and Mobility Project at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia also asked um, how the new uh, 
unemployment insurance allowance looks for domestic workers or workers who are paid primarily in cash. So she brings up this cash payment issue. So, so how do those issues play out? Okay, sure. So as you can imagine, this is a complex one. Um, I'll start with if they are not being paid in cash. So mm -hmm. um, if they can prove their income, they should be eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, if they're not classified, so if they're classified as employees and paid on the books, they're eligible for unemployment insurance like everyone else. If they're misclassified as independent contractors or self-employed, um, they would be eligible under the, the sort of disaster portion of this new bill that is bringing in those workers. Um, and like one of the problems is not being able to prove that you're monetarily eligible. So you have to have some minimum earnings and it varies by state to qualify for UI. So not being able to prove that could be a hurdle. Um, and too many domestic and care workers are paid under the table, um, in which case um, it, it's very difficult to, to access the program. And then I would be remiss if I didn't say that there's also a lot of those workers who are undocumented and there's nothing in the bill um, for them. Um, and generally they're not uh, eligible for UI at any time. Yeah. Okay, great. So there are still, still some holes there. Um, so I wanted to go to a question from my colleague, uh, Shelley Stewart at the Aspen Institute Future of Work Initiative. Um, and she writes that the CARES Act does a lot to expand unemployment insurance benefits, but are these short-term fixes or what still needs to be done to make UI more accessible and equitable in kind of the longer term? And I think this issue, particularly about including, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, freelance workers and um, those kinds of workers would be of particular interest in this question as well. Sure, so it is, true that most of these benefits are temporary. The $600 expires at the end of July and the rest of the um, benefits expire at the end of the year. Um, we know in this country from previous depressions and recessions that when there's a crisis, there's also an opportunity to make change, permanent structural change. So some of the permanent structural changes that we need to see um, is for the federal government to create um, a baseline of um, a baseline of, uh, of a safety net for everyone. Because right now, depending on what state you live in, you have access to 12 weeks of benefits or 26 weeks of benefits or 16 weeks of benefits. And how much your payment is, is also set by your state. So for instance, in Mississippi, the maximum you can receive is $235 a week. Um, some states go up to 600 per week. So having like a federal floor where this is where you will not fall below. That applies to all states, I think would be super important. And then there's other pieces that could be changed in the program to make it more accessible for low wage workers um, and also for women. Um, we'll probably get to this, but um, there is a provision in some state laws where part-time workers um, are not eligible for UI because they can only work part-time hours. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are some of the big pieces that we need to to fill in to make this program actually work for everyone. Yeah, okay, so great. So so just to clarify, because I'm looking at, um, we, we're getting lots of questions. And so on that, um, workers who wouldn't have qualified. So uh, somebody writes, many low-income workers who have been laid off wouldn't have qualified historically. Uh, because they may not have been working during the base periods. They wouldn't have had sufficient hours or wages. Um, have those requirements been uh, for eligibility been waived in most states or was that waived through the federal legislation? Where, where does sort of the responsibility for making that work lie? There is um, in the, the provision in the what we call the PUA, which is the, the pandemic unemployment assistance, the one that's based off the disasters that pulls in the other workers that also um, potentially would allow workers who don't earn enough to actually be qualified in, in this period of time of the pandemic. So that's something that folks can follow up with their uh, state agencies about. I should also just say that a lot of, that this, all of these changes are really new and the state agencies need time to actually reprogram their computers and train their staff and, and do things to actually be able to, um, to get the funds out the door and to know what the new rules are. 
And so some of this will be folks having to just keep an eye out for when the agency is saying they're ready to start taking those applications. Yeah. Um, so, so on that, I, I had a, just a general question of how soon uh, should someone apply for unemployment benefits when they get laid off? So for folks who are trying to work with folks who've been recently laid off, how should they advise them about when to apply? As soon as possible. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I have another question from somebody who says they have a, um, a customer who was laid off, exhausted their unemployment insurance benefits before the pandemic, and they wanna know if they qualify for the extension now. So if you were, if you exhausted after July 31st, 2019, then yes, you do qualify for the extension. Okay, great. Um, uh, I have a question from somebody, uh, you know, on behalf of a nonprofit organization. This was sent um, by a program officer uh, with the Weinberg Foundation. Um, uh, there's this question about uh, the 600 uh, uh, UI benefit, whether that's funded by the federal government. Is it is it funded for even reimbursable employers? Sort of. Um, uh, there was some confusion about whether that money would be refunded or if the, or if uh, for nonprofit employers who are sort of those reimbursable employers, if they would have to pay that $600. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just to set this up a little bit for folks who don't understand the question, um, most unemployment insurance benefits are covered because employers pay into the unemployment insurance tax system. And then it's um, experience rated. So like with a car insurance, if you have an accident, it, your, your rate goes up. If you lay off staff, your rate goes up. But for certain employers like nonprofits and government agencies, they don't pay into the system. Instead, they're reimbursable employers. So they actually reimburse the state agency for the UI benefits that are paid to their employees when they're laid off. Um, so in the, the case of the $600, that is fully federally funded. So um, nonprofits would not be uh, required to pay any of that. And then additionally, um, as part of the legislation through the end of the year, um, they only have to pay 50% of what they need to reimburse the agencies for. Great. Um, so I have a question that uh, uh, one person, um, uh, well, from Wendy Copeland, Chief Mission and Partnership Officer at Goodwill in, in Industries International. Um, you know, she notes that uh, as, you know, many jobs are being lost, some of them, or maybe even most of them, might not be returning or might not be returning in, in sort of their usual form. Uh, so could, you know, is there incentives for reskilling or upskilling as folks are out of work? Are there things that they could do or um, so that they could be prepared to kind of bridge into a next opportunity uh, to earn a livelihood? Um, so are there any, anything to say about that? Sure. Um, I think where we are is unprecedented, right? We don't really know what's going to happen or what which businesses are going to come back. So it's a really great question. Um, there is um, a provision in some states' unemployment insurance programs where they pay benefits and the employee can, or the person who had lost their job, can actually do training while they're unemployed. So instead of, so generally you, you need to be looking for new work. So instead of looking for new work, you're actually allowed to do training and it would cover you. Um, so you'd get the benefit to support you while you're doing training for an in-demand occupation. And there's a handful of states that have that provision. So perhaps this would be something that more states would want to take advantage of to encourage that upskilling. Great, so that leads into the next question, which is, um, you know, are there particular states you'd point to that you say have kind of best practice unemployment insurance models that other states should um, try to adopt and um, both sort of in times of crisis and in the long term. This comes from our colleagues at the Aspen Institute Forum on Women and Girls. Um, a couple of states that have uh, pretty good programs and particularly are, um, are prepared for this recession would be Oregon and Washington State. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are two programs that you could look to um, to see some of the innovative things that they're doing. Okay, any, any of the things that you'd call out particularly that they're doing? Um, uh, 
um, let me circle back to you on that one. Okay. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Michelle Evermore, who's a senior policy mm -hmm. analyst with me here at NELP, who has been helping me with the answers to some of these questions, like beforehand, she and I talked, and uh, she's offered to to answer sort of on the spot. So I can put that in the chat and she will give us a response. So we can circle back to it. Excellent, great. Um, and uh, also, you know, this challenge of, um, uh, there's a couple of questions around sort of how do we make sure people are aware. Um, so there's a, a question about how can we get the word out about uh, UI benefits, to, particularly to um, gig workers or other workers who might not have thought of themselves as eligible. Um, and also Annalise uh, Goger at Brookings adds, how can we reach, um, uh, how can we reach folks without internet access and what are the ways to do that? Okay, so Maureen, let me answer the other question about the state models and then let's okay. start to this one. So, um, some, so Oregon um, has put a lot of thought into planning um, and so state, and, and we have some information that I can actually uh, give you to post in the chat to give a link for folks who wanna get the details. Another state is Michigan um, that has been looking at ways that they can ex expedite what we call short-term compensation or work sharing, which is a layoff prevention program that receives some extra money um, in the federal legislation. Um, and those are, those are the main ones I would, um, I would point out in terms of more detail that Michelle okay. information. Great. And just on that, because we have a few, I just noticed this other one about um, state unemployment insurance offices. Are they, um, is there a role, you know, are some of them waiting for guidance from DOL about how to do some of these things? Is that part of their setup or, um, uh, you know, I guess people are it's trying to figure out when, when are they going to get online and, and what are the steps? Sure. Um, so, you know, for the just regular claimants that weren't, the regular claims that weren't you know, affected by the federal legislation. So just your regular, you were laid off during the pandemic, you, you should be able to go ahead and apply right. for the benefits and start receiving them. And then they may need guidance around how or time to program in this extra $600, but then folks would get that retroactively. So, so, so for the folks who are um, in this category for the pandemic unemployment programs, so the self-employed independent contractors, gig workers, right. those folks may not be able to apply right away because states may be um, still working on um, their systems to be able to take those claims. Um, the best place would be to look at the website for the state agency. Um, they often have a frequently asked questions section um, for that and may, may give some estimate as to when they expect to be able to take those kinds of claims. Um, but but that's, that's pretty much, so they are taking claims um, and that anything that you're due that you can't get through to do, you will get it retroactively. Okay, great. Okay, so now, um, did we want to circle back to something yeah. else? Yes. Um, and if you could ask it again, because. I was, I, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was, oh, so this was, was making sure that people, people know, um, particularly gig workers, who, that they know what they're eligible for, and mm -hmm. also um, people who don't have interact internet access? What, what can we do to make sure people know? I think um, given that most of us are in the house, right, in our states, um, that trying to make the information available in like, you know, media, but also different types of media, so radio. So we're right now working, my organization is working on a plan to help um, increase outreach um, and using uh, connections with our state partners to also try to help increase outreach. But I would say at this point, like media coverage um, is going to help and um, every channel that we have for that, so radio included. Okay. Because cause if you don't have internet, you generally do have access to radio, so that would be another place. Um, and so in zeroing in on how we help get the word out, part of that strategy is 
connecting with the local folks who know how the workers um, that they represent receive information. So they'll they'll be able to tailor it to to how they need to receive it. Yeah. Okay. Which which Great. also may include right translation services. Oh, right. Interesting. Interesting. So, and I think I I love that of of using um, radio. That's a really uh, I think, I think that's really interesting. Um, are there other ways? I'm just curious, like, um, I'm just, you know, thinking about sort of the things I've been getting from school systems and things like that. Are there ways to sort of partner with school systems that are maybe delivering food or things like that to also have ask them to share information? Would that be something people could look into if they're working with their school systems? Sure. So in the past recession, um, we connected and the states connected with other sort of forms of aid and assistance, right? So if with the food bank and the United Way, mm -hmm. and um, so having some cross fertilization between those agencies about what's available, or even just a flyer at the food bank or a flyer at um, the United Way location, but making sure that that folks can, act, can find out about UI even when they're searching for other resources. Yeah, great. Um, Okay, so are full-time college students whose employers laid them off uh, able to receive unemployment insurance? Um, my understanding is that at least in Massachusetts, applying for unemployment insurance requires applicants to indicate if they are going to school full-time and they would need special approval since they are supposed to be av available for full-time work and it's assumed full-time students are not. Is there anything in the federal responses that give UI benefits to those attending school full-time? Let me chat Michelle on that one um, and see if I can get any information. Just one second. Okay. And do we know if the person is returning to school? I, or, or looking for. Or I don't know if they're returning to school or they may even be still attending school online, but you know, trying to support themselves while they're in school as so many uh, college students are doing these days, right? So, um, so okay. yeah, she's, so. She's typing, so we'll have this for you in just a second. I, I know uh, some about this because um, when I started at the organization at National Employment Law Project, um, I came in as the staff attorney doing unemployment insurance policy around the last recession. And so there's some deep knowledge that I have but then there's also some questions that are stomping me. And so Michelle um, generously um, agreed to, to just help out if we get in a jam. So she says that there is nothing really clear in the legislation regarding any change in el eligibility um, based on whether you're eligible in your state. And so because the program is grafted onto the state program. Um, and um, she also said that there are lots of exceptions in the bill. And so for some of these things like this, it may be helpful to check back after the guidance comes out and we know more. Okay. Do you know when we should expect guidance to come out? Do you have, have a sense of that? I don't have any information on that, but generally um, folks probably, my guess would be that the folks at Department of Labor are working around the clock to get it out. Yeah. Um, this is urgent for everyone. So, right. but I don't have any sort of sense of whether that's a week or, or a few days or I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so uh, I have another question about tipped workers. How do you account for tipped workers, particularly considering the tipped minimum and that many workers earn cash above that average? So this kind of connects a little to that cash question. Sure. So, you know, we talked about earlier that you have to have a minimum earnings to uh, qualify for unemployment insurance. And so the first thing that they would want to do is just file the way everyone else files. Um, and if for some reason their employer hasn't reported their tips, and so that causes them to not qualify monetarily, then um, they could uh, check to see if the pandemic unemployment program so the one that brings in all the other workers to see if that program, um, they could qualify under that program. And they would need to, I don't know the specifics, but most likely need to have some proof of, um, of the tips or the income that they are using to qualify. Okay, great. So I have a question from uh, our colleagues in the financial security program 
Um, and the question they pose is, um, uh, can we reform unemployment insurance policy and implementation so that the end users of the system have a say in how the system works for them? Um, they say, uh, or why do we see rampant lack of accountability when it comes to serving vulnerable workers? What are the reform steps that are needed to make sure elected officials are accountable to their constituents who need support from unemployment insurance? Mm -hmm. So I think just sort of uh, taking a step back and looking at history, right? Um, policymaking has not always been inclusive in this country. And we know that race and gender are issues that have prevented that. And so when the unemployment insurance program was created in the 30s um, in the, during the depression, certain categories of workers were left out. And the rules were designed for full-time males who were breadwinners, right? And so if you weren't that, it really wasn't designed for you. And it left out a lot of workers of color who were doing agricultural work and domestic work. And so from the outset, it hasn't been an inclusive program. And because it's not visible when folks don't need it, it's very hard to build support to, um, to make it better in the states, right? So it's very visible right now, but the rest of the time it's not visible. And so having, being able to build a constituency and do organizing around how do we improve the programs because they are determined, a lot, most of the rules are state by state. Right, right. Okay, great, thank you. I knew you were the perfect person to answer that question. <laughs> um, okay, are there any restrictions around this extra $600? Uh, one person writes that they have a client who is just approved for $150 a week in unemployment insurance benefits. Is it reasonable to expect she'll now get $750 a week? So she will get the $600, so it will add up to $750, whether it comes out in two different checks, or most of it is not checks, it's electronic transfers at this point. So whether it comes out in one check or two, yes, that person will qualify for it. And it'll take the agency time to get the system rejiggered to be able to process that. So they may not get it right away, but they will get it retroactively. Okay, great. Um, this question, I'm not sure. Um, uh, we have w the the question is: We work with disabled clients who are paid for the work they they do. Are they considered employees for eligibility to to apply for unemployment benefits, and therefore eligible to apply for unemployment benefits? I don't know the. I don't know enough about this one to give you a definitive yeah. answer. But what I will say is that generally, you know, there's three pieces of being eligible. Do you have enough previous earnings? Do you have good cause for leaving your job? And the third one is, are you able and available for work? And so I think that third poll of whether they're able and available for work would be something as determined by state law in the state that they're in would be the, the sort of question to answer, to answer that. So that could be different in, in different states. Um, okay, uh, um, let's see. So uh, I have a question about um, vulnerable workers who don't have bank accounts and will be relying on paper checks from the IRS that will take months to arrive. Um, is there a similar issue for them with unemployment insurance benefits? So I couldn't tell you for exactly every state, but I think lots of states have gone to um, issuing benefits on um, a debit card, so on, onto a prepaid debit card that then you can take in the bank and withdraw the cash. Um, that's something that some of them have been doing. I'm not sure if there are other ones issuing paper checks, but I don't think that there's a whole lot of time lag um, if, if they are doing paper checks. So it's not, it's not the kind of time lag like with the IRS. Okay, I have a question on the documentation that self-employed and independent workers need to provide in order to qualify. Um, I, I know you've touched on this, but is there anything we should add on that? Um, like this one, I can't get terribly specific um, beyond just like proof of income, right? Yeah. So whatever those documents are for your particular situation. And then as we get 
more guidance and the states are closer to being able to actually process the payments, your individual state will let you know exactly what they need you to bring. Okay. If people are experiencing delays in getting connected to unemployment insurance, given all the volume, um, uh, will benefits be retroactive to when somebody was laid off or to when they file? The benefits will be retroactive. You will be, part. one of the questions they ask you is when did you leave your job? So, so they'll be paid based on that rather than not being able to get through. And, and I would just encourage folks to continue to try to get through um, and to consider trying to get through at off peak times. So early in the morning or late at night, if those are possible for you and to just keep trying and don't give up. Okay. Okay, great. So that sort of answers the next question, which was particularly around people who don't have internet and they're trying to call and the phones can't get through if you have any suggestions for rectifying i guess it's just keep trying huh right right and in normal times when we're not um in a situation where we're uh, sheltering in place um public areas like the public library would be a place that that folks have relied on uh to to file when they don't have internet at home um but in this case um phone is going to be the next best thing and then depending on how the pandemic goes, there may be agencies who uh, decide to open um, and do the social distancing to allow folks to be able to use the computers there. But I haven't heard any of that. Um, it, it's just mm -hmm. it's something that they could do, but you know, it's gonna be a, a state decision. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, and I know we touched a little bit on immigrant uh, communities, um, but uh, this, uh, person writes there are concerns from immigrant and refugee communities about accessing pandemic unemployment and failing the public charge standard for pending immigration cases. Any guidance that has emerged on this issue for these communities? So on our website, we have a, a short um, a short document that answers this very question. And so I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Um, but if you go to nelp.org, um, we have a page that's dedicated just to pandemic resources, and there is a short memo that explains, um, particularly for immigrant workers, and it addresses the public charge question. Great, thank you. Um, uh, in this situation, can you file for unemployment if you have worked less than six months? Um, I think the answer is going to be, it depends because all of the states, they all have different rules in terms of how much you have to earn at a minimum and what's the minimum amount of benefits that they'll pay. So for instance, here in Maryland where I live, the smallest benefit payment is $50 a week. And so there's um, over the look back period, which is generally the 18 months prior to when you work, they will look back during that period and see if you have enough wages to qualify. Um, and for some states, it's a little complicated. They want you to have wages in two quarters. So it's possible that they could, um, depending on their state, and that they, they should, if they can find the state rules and find them um, easy to understand, that's a place to start. Um, and otherwise, go ahead and apply. And if you don't meet the qualifications, they will um, they'll let you know. And there may be something that, they, that can be done based on the pandemic unemployment program. Right, great. Um, so um, this is a, I think, particularly interesting question for this moment. What happens if an individual is furloughed and refuses to return to work, which you can imagine people doing if they're concerned about um, uh, being exposed to the, to the virus? Can okay. the individual still receive unemployment? So if you are furloughed and your employer says you can't come back to work indefinitely or you can't come back to work until um, you can apply for unemployment insurance for the time that you're not working. Now, in terms of whether they call you back and you won't go back because of safety, lots of states have a health and safety um, exception to just cause. So if your health and safety are at risk, that that is a good reason for quitting the job. I'm not sure how that is actually working with the pandemic and some of the other 
pieces of the legislation. So um, that's that's as definitive as I can get. Uh -huh. If your if your reason for not returning is because of caregiving responsibilities, is that similar or is that different? So I'm glad you asked that question. Um, one of the pieces um, that we fought for in the last recession and that several states do have in place is what we call um, compelling family reasons as a just cause to quit your job. And so that would be illness of yourself or others. And lots of states do have that on the books for their state law. Um, and so in those states, um, that would qualify, and um, there's also states that don't have it. So it's very, very specific to, to where you live. Um, will farm owners and farm workers be eligible for unemployment insurance? Let me ask Michelle that one um, and see what she says. Okay. Um, so, uh, And she's typing, so okay. I want to hang on just a sec and then. Sure. Um, she says, we assume so, but we really have to wait for the guidance to come out to be sure. So the, the guidance around the legislation, um, they usually are under disaster unemployment insurance. And so for this pandemic unemployment insurance, which is based off of disaster employment insurance, they should be, um, but we haven't seen any guidance that says it specifically. Okay, great. Um, will people potentially be delayed in getting their unemployment insurance benefits if their state staff can't get in touch with the employer to confirm the terms or reason for their dismissal? Uh, many small employers have closed their do doors altogether or may be very difficult to reach if they're no longer working on site. Right. So, so one of the things employers can do to help folks that they are laying off and, you know, often they are very distraught about having to lay folks off is to actually provide that information affirmatively. Um, because a lot of the delay in terms of approving folks is verifying that information. Okay, but so so that could be a problem though if a small business didn't do that and they've closed their doors um, That could present a delay for somebody who's laid off or is there I'm something not, else they can do? I'm not sure exactly how the agency would handle that my I think what would be logical is that you would bring documents to prove your income which would be right. important and then if the employer is not going to contest the claim or can't be reached. Um, it, it may be that they rely on what you what you say, but I'm not sure exactly. And because every state has their own rules, um, I'm not exactly sure on that one. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so, do working visa holders like H-1B, TN, etc., do they also qualify for these unemployment insurance benefits? Um, I would, uh, again, point them to our website and um, our document there should address that. Um, I don't have the details and I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. Okay. Um, let's see. So I think we covered that. Um, I, and, and I think the answer to this is yes. Uh, I have a client who's currently receiving unemployment insurance before COVID-19. She has four weeks remaining with the extension of 13 weeks and this additional $600 apply to her. Uh, oh, and would this be automatically or would she have to reapply to get that? Um, it should apply automatically. Um, and then she should just be paying attention for any communication from the agency as to whether they require any new documentation to continue. Okay, um, a question is, should we encourage all workers to apply for unemployment insurance, um, even if we think that they might not be eligible since there's no penalty for applying and not being eligible? I think we should. And one of the reasons we should is because the biggest reason that workers don't qualify for UI is because they don't apply. 
And the reason they don't apply is because they think it won't cover them. And mm -hmm. so that's been a problem historically in the program, particularly for workers who, um, who are not college educated. They tend to feel like they're not going to qualify. And also for workers of color, this is also a big problem. So yes, you should apply. I think you have to temper that by the volume that the agencies are having and to keep trying until you get through. Okay, um, there's, a, there's a question. Do governors have any discretion on whether to pass along the expanded unemployment insurance benefits, the extra $600? Um, based on a couple of analyses I've read of the bill, my understanding is that these expanded benefits are automatically awarded to people, but I've also heard different interpretations of the latest bill. So. Okay, um, let me just double check with Michelle because I think I know the answer to this one. And, and also just keep in mind that when the guidance does come out, we will uh, post it, a link to it on our website, so NELP.org. So um, for some of these questions that we can't answer because they're, they haven't been, we haven't seen the guidance to know exactly how they're gonna handle them, that is a place you can check back um, to get the answer for that. Okay. Okay, there's also a question back to the issue of um, reimbursable nonprofits, just saying, please explain the reimbursable provision for nonprofits. Does that vary by state? Okay, um, sure. And so on this question of can a state say no? I mean, a state could probably say no, but we can't see any reason why one would do that. Okay. Um, and then uh, ask me that question again. Sure. Um, Oopsie. Uh, please explain the reimbursable provision for nonprofits. Does that vary by state? Um, it does not vary by state. And in, in normal times, so without any of this federal legislation, nonprofits are, uh, do not pay uh, taxes into the UI system. Um, and so they reimburse the UI system um, for the benefits that are paid out. And so because of the federal legislation uh, for the remainder of the year, they will only have to reimburse the system 50%. So that was something that was in the bill to help nonprofits and other reimbursables in particular. Okay, so what about employees that are in different states? This is relevant to us here in the uh, District Maryland, Virginia area. Do they apply in the state they live in or the state that they work in? Um, let me ask my magic assistant, Michelle. Um, <laughs> okay, and she'll, she'll respond. So if you want to go on to the next question. Yeah. So if, as many as possible. Yeah. So if someone applied, I think, um, I think, if someone applied for unemployment, you know, if their hours were cut and, and then they were furloughed. So what is the process for updating an application? Okay. So she says last state that they worked in is where they would file. So where you work, not where you live. Correct. Okay. Um, and then you said the question was if uh, someone was furloughed, but their hours were reduced. If, 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 when, if someone applied for unemployment when their hours were cut and then were furloughed, what is the process for updating an application? So if you applied for the partial and then you're completely unemployed. Right, so there are weekly certifications that you have to make with the agency. And so not, not having personally done the process, my, my assumption is that there would be an opportunity there for you to update that you're not working any hours anymore and that you're, you've been furloughed. Um, okay, so, uh, and, and I'm wondering if with that, um, uh, if, if you just wanna comment on sort of if people's hours are cut but they're not 
um, completely unemployed, they can still apply for some uh, benefits. Um, and is, is that still very, does that vary across states or maybe you could just comment on that a little bit? Yes, so every state has um, a program called partial unemployment insurance. Um, and it, it does sort of disregard some of the earnings that you're still making. And depending on what formula the state uses, you could be eligible for some UI to help make up the difference um, for the wages that you're not earning. But the formulas are very specific to states. Um, so really couldn't get into any detail on that, but to say that um, they should apply and, um, and you know, if there's any information on their state website that sort of a Q&A on that, maybe check that first. But um, if you can't get the answer, um, it doesn't hurt to apply. Okay. Um, uh, is there anything in particular about the document that we should alert people to about the documentation or proof uh, that's required for those applying for unemployment insurance because their children's school or daycare is closed and they cannot go to work? We need to document that. Um, so they're 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 laid off for that reason. Is that what we're saying? Uh, they or they're out. Of, they're laid off, or they're not able to work because of you know their. Um, because of the caregiving need. I'm checking with Michelle on that one. Just checking my answer with her just a second. Okay. All right, somebody sent in a useful comment just to let people know that if people are enrolled in the Federal Workforce Program, uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and participate in Workforce and Innovation Opportunity Act uh, funded training, the unemployment insurance work search requirement is waived while in training because by definition, you are training to get a new job. It is a DOL requirement that the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and unemployment insurance services be integrated in American job centers. Each state might handle the reporting requirements differently. So that's a useful thing for folks to know. Um, so, so on this Do you question, want to comment? Yeah. On this question, um, in terms of not being able to work because of childcare or caregiving, um, that is specifically covered under the pandemic unemployment um, program, the one that is expanding the eligibility for workers who don't usually get UI. And most states are working to, to add that as good cause um, for regular unemployment insurance as well. Okay, um, a quick question. Does unemployment insurance treat hourly and salaried workers differently? No, not really. Um, there's that baseline um, of earnings that you have to you have to meet an earnings threshold, um, and that is the same whether you're hourly or salary. Okay. Um, uh, are um, are federal unemployment insurance dollars available on a first come first serve basis? What if the money runs out? It is not available on a first come first serve basis. It is available to everyone who qualifies until the end date. So on the $600, the end date as of now is July 31st. And for the other program benefits through the end of the year. So there you sh folks shouldn't worry about it running out. Mm -hmm. Uh, will somebody with an a internship with a specific contract starting and ending date be qualified for unemployment insurance? That one I can't answer. Um, I'll ask Michelle, but we should keep going. Okay. Uh, yes, we should, because we are quickly running out of time and not running out of questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am a small business owner and I am on payroll for my S Corp small business and we are closed. Can I apply for unemployment benefits? They would be able to apply with the pandemic unemployment program. Um, that one that covers self-employed um, and independent contractors and the like. And my cat wants to answer UI questions too. 
I see that. <laughs> An extra lifeline. Yeah. Um, would a recent college graduate who left work in June of 2019 to study abroad qualify? Um, so hold that one and let's circle back to the one for interns. Um, likely eligible under the pandemic program, but we need to see the guidance um, to, to answer it more with more certainty. Um, so, okay. So if you want to circle back to the one you just asked me. Okay. Uh, so the one I just asked you uh, I, about a college student, is that the one I just Yes, the, the study abroad. Yeah. If you study abroad, yes. So if you, if you graduated and then you took a little time to study abroad, would you be eligible? Um, Michelle says I should mention that if you've been offered a job and then the offer was rescinded, you are also eligible. Um, so circling back to the question, um, is the study abroad sort of in between when they were working? Like, yeah, it wasn't really clear. It sounds like they graduated and they took a little time to go abroad before really kind of settling into a job search. Okay. So what I would say is back to our basics on, did you earn enough in your look back period? Um, based on your state's rules. And so if you did, you should qualify. Okay. Are there incentives that could be implemented to increase engagement in virtual job training activities? For example, here in Washington State, we have suspended the requirement to do mandated job search for UI. However, we could increase the individual's monetary benefit if they participate in virtual workshops or training. What are other potential solutions to make sure job seekers are incentivized to gain employability skills while in quarantine? I know there are agencies do have reemployment assistance programs that are um, all about helping folks get a new job. Um, I don't have a lot of detail on, on how those work. Um, in terms of incentives, I think it's important to, to say that you know, folks who don't have jobs want to find new jobs. And I think that folks who need to have new skills are probably way more worried about that than we are. And so I, I think when we think incentives, we shouldn't always think that folks need to be forced to do something, right? So I would want to approach it more from the, how can we resource them um, for, for what they need? And yeah. you know, I, don't, I don't have a lot of knowledge about how the training programs work. So I can't really speak to that one. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, I think that's exactly right, though. The question is really, how do we help them prepare for what might come next? Um, uh, nobody knows what it is, but, um, but yeah, people could really, I'm sure, use that kind of help and support at this point. Um, I see we are pretty much at time. Um, we didn't get to all of our questions. Thanks, everybody, so much for so many um, incredibly good and thoughtful questions. And um, we will be trying to sort of organize these questions. Um, Rebecca, I'll share them with, with you and your team. Um, I'm sure that there's lots of resources on the um, uh, National Employment Law Project website. So if you go to nelp.org, there will be other resources there for answering questions. And, um, and we'll organize these, Rebecca, and share them with you and your team and maybe post some additional um, information on our website as well if there's other points to, points to raise. But um, thanks, everybody, so much for, for joining us. Um, and uh, we'll be back again with more conversations in our Opportunity in America series. Um, if there's something in particular you want us to have a conversation on, please let us know. You can always uh, tweet at us using the hashtag talk opportunity or uh, send us an email at uh, eop at uh, aspeninstitute.org. Um, and thank you again for joining us. Uh, hope we get to talk again soon. Bye-bye.